You ever, anybody ever go snowboarding or, or skiing? Any, any skiers amongst us? One, two, okay, one, two, you, you skier over here probably. But Ron's a snowboarder? No, skier. Uh, what a terrible sport. Just joking, just joking. It's fine to do it, but man, that's not a sport for me. Uh, I remember the first time I went, I, I was like 17, thinking, man, I'll be all, I'll be all cool, I'll get my, my snowboard on and, and see what happens. And I, I remember we went to Jackson Hole, which is not the normal course, I think, for most people to start out on, but it's the one that I was at, so I was like, oh, I'll do this. And on the advice of my friends, they said, hey, um, you should probably just ride on the bunny hill for a while. And, and so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go learn on the bunny hill. And so, you know, four hours on a bunny hill, staring, I'm a mountain man, and staring up at that big, beautiful mountain was really hard on me. And especially when you see this tram that can take you right to the top, you don't have to walk up, you don't have to drive, you can just ride this little seat up there and get to the top. And it was, it was so neat, four hours into the ski trip, we, it, it, you know, it's three hours back to land, that's where I was raised. And um, so it was about an hour before the bus was leaving. And I was like, you know what, I got time. I got time. I, I'm gonna take the tram, I'm gonna go to the top. I'm experienced, I've been snowboarding for four hours. I can do this. And, and I got on the tram and I'm thinking to myself, okay, it'd be really great if I get on with like people that have also been snowboarding for hour, four hours or less, you know, that would be good. But no, I, I got on the, the tram with two guys that were talking about skiing in Sweden and, oh. and it was kind of a joke and it meant like how hard this mountain is. And, and they were talking amongst themselves and I'm kind of huddled on the corner listening and they, they look over at me and they go, so how long have you been snowboarding? And I'm like, four hours. <laughs> And I remember those two looking at me like, have you been on the bunny hill all day? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I've been. And they're like, this is not the bunny hill. What are you doing on this? And they, they, they said, the first thing you need to know is that, that this hill is not the same as the bunny hill. Because on the bunny hill, you got this nice little like snow mound that they built for you so you can they'll slow the tram down for you. And you can like get on it and just kind of glide off. They do that there. They don't do that up here. <laughs> they won't slow down for you. In fact, they said it's a, it's a two foot jump off the tram to the oh. snow. You got to get prepared for that. And, and so I'm listening to this going, what did I just do. It's coming closer and closer and I'm thinking to myself, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. They get off just fine and I'm hesitating because I'm like, I don't know what to do. Last night I jump off and, and you know, I, I, I face planted it. <laughs> right there in front of everybody. And, and they don't, they weren't even some joking, they don't slow that tram down. And so I, they're coming right behind me and I'm army crawling as fast as I can, dragging my snowboard behind me. And, and I, I, I kind of roll over on my back so I'm in safety and I look up at everybody and they're looking at me like, <laughs> what is this guy doing up here? But the nice thing about skiing hills is that the turnovers quit because they want to get down the hill. So, that, so the, the people I were embarrassed by, they went downhill. And I was, once again, just with people that didn't know how terrible I was. And so I was just standing there looking down way at this little tiny bus. And on the bunny hill, you can go like zigzags. And they're okay with that. Not on the bunny hill. Not on the big hill. They're like... It's just like a bullet filer. I mean, if you go zigzagging on that hill, you're, you're going to get killed. And, and, and I almost was. And so I started down the hill, and I'm kind of doing my zigzag, watch, watching people, and 45 minutes go by. And I'm thinking, I'm almost done. So I stopped, and I looked down the hill, and the bus is still dead. There. I've gone maybe a quarter of the way down. <laughs> so I said to myself, I'm not going to zigzag it anymore. I'm going to do what my daughter does. She's really good at snowboarding, weirdly. I don't know where she gets that. <laughs> I'm gonna turn the board downhill like this. Instead of going down like this, I'm gonna turn it to like this. I made it. <laughs> I, I'm alive. I wrecked probably 10 of the most horrific wrecks ever seen on that mountain going down it. And I got off the hill going about 30 minutes late. They almost left me. I had to call my parents. But I made it, and I remember going, there's nothing in this world that will tell you you're not ready yet. <laughs> then going to the top of the mountain and having the mountain tell you that for you. Yeah. Now, now, I tell you that illustration. I don't, I don't mean to go so rabbit trail, but I tell you that illustration today because I love the Word of God. And what I love about the Word of God is its ability to tell you sometimes, hey, we've got some work to do. You're not on the mountain yet. <laughs> 
You, 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 in fact, you think you're there, but we've, we've got some processes to, to, to get done in your life. And, and so here's some tough passages that maybe we should work on to actually become the people in God that we're supposed to become. Uh, the last four weeks, we've been having this, uh, this, this sermon series called Two by Four Passages. The, the idea of, of passages that we read from time to time. And, and when they read it, and we read it, and it, it feels like someone is two by fouring our spirit. And we read them, they're good, but they, they hurt. Once again, I've said this before, my daddy was the best spanker in the world. And it, and it wasn't because he knew how to swing the paddle. It was because he knew when to spank. And uh, he, he knew when I needed correction. And these Bible verses, what I love about it, they, they know when to spank the spirit. He's that good. And say, they're spank our spirit and say, get into gear. Or from time to time, slow down. We, 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 we started by talking about letting him be the king of our hearts. Uh, the always fun, love your enemy. Okay? Um, we're, we're talking about, last week we talked about following the will of God. And today I'm using a unique passage, because you're coming out of the book of James again, that, uh, that, that is often kind of taken and used for one very specific purpose concept of struggle, but when you put it all together, the, the finality, finale that James has in verse 27 is, is this wonderful idea of, hey, there's this idea of what religion looks like, and, and then there's this idea of what true heart holiness looks like, and, and I prayed this week, so give me some grace, I prayed really hard that God would put my, my words together in a cohesive experience that everybody here today might possibly hear a word today that says, I will be just religious. I don't want that. It's not actually what God wants from me, but I want to be a holiness, a, a heart holiness human being. Um, so let's read the word today. It's in James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. And in case uh, you didn't bring your Bible, I do always put it on the screen behind me. Um, so you can read along with me. But James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. Uh, we will be working through it kind of verse by verse, so keep your finger there um, today. It reads like this. It says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. In other words, don't just... Sorry, I get ahead of myself. Let me just keep reading. Uh, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and, and, and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like somebody who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Amen. The Word of God. Now, now like I said, this is a very popular passage of Scripture that, that from time to time... Um, has really had two verses get used out of it. And, and, and really it's, it's 19 and 20. The two verses that a lot of people will just kind of take and use any time that maybe there's an angry situation or an anger thing happens. And they'll, they'll quote this. And, and, and I, I, don't, I don't have a problem necessarily with, with um, that. I, I don't, where, where they just take those two verses and use it. Because it, it, it's pretty much what James is talking about. Hey, if you've got an anger situation, Here's what you should should consider. So I, I like that. And I've heard entire passage of scriptures. You know, be, be quick to listen. Uh, uh, slow to speak. Slow to become angry. Because human anger, well, that doesn't produce righteousness that God desires. Again, I, I don't have a problem when they use that verse as kind of a life motivational tool. Uh, it's a great passage of scripture that in all reality does stand on its own. You ever see those posters with that kitty cat? That, that's hanging on a, a string and, and the, the, the little caption says, hang in there, buddy. You ever see that? And, and people are like, I think 
weirdly motivated by that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know the kid, it doesn't motivate me, but you know, you put that couple of verses on a motivational poster, hanging around town, and there's gonna be a couple of people that might be a little two by four, might be may, reminded, hey, slow down. You're not to the mountain yet. <laughs> You, there, there's some anger that, 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 that could arise because of the situation. Pray about it. Slow down. Pray about it. Think. It's, it's a great passage of Scripture. Stands on its own. But when you read the rest of the passage of Scripture, you'll notice that, that James is a, he uses anger as a, a great launching point. But he, he opens the door to a whole lot broader conversation about sin. And, and, and he, t- he goes into this idea of moral filth. He says, get rid of all moral filth, all of this evil, and, and, and the very in the way he wraps it up, see, he, he brings it back to a very finite description of taming the tongue, which has a lot to do with this idea of rash thinking. Slow down, pray about it, think about it. For true righteousness that is considered in the eyes of God pure and faultless, he says, is, is taking care of the widows and the orphans, which is a, a great idea of saying anybody that's in a lesser position than you, take care of them, humble yourself. In other words, be in action, and then rid yourself from the world. True religion, he says, it's faultless and pure. Um, Because clearly, when James wrote this, he was was looking around at his world. He was looking around at his world, he was, he was thinking to himself, okay, what, 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 is, what are some of the things that and the Spirit's working in him? What are some of the things I really need to kind of pinpoint and say, hey, guys, we're not really being the church if, if we behave like this. And, and so he says, you know, the orphans and poor, you know, if you claim to love Jesus today, and, and, and we see the need, we see the orphan, we see the poor, and, and, and i.e. what he's saying there, some pretty messy situations... And, and this is how we do life. Pretend that stand is the universal idea of orphans, the ones in need, the poor. And, and we're the Christian. And, and we're walking life like this. Oh, that's messy. That is, I don't want to deal with that. I see it. I, I've heard it. But I'm not dealing with it. <laughs> James is looking around and saying, okay, it's, it's a problem there. And probably in 2016, it's a problem now. I think it's something we need to look at in our heart and say, if, if, are we truly being uh, the righteous, the pure, the faultless, heart holiness people that, that God wants us to be? And if we aren't, I, I think, well, we, we need to ask ourselves how we can be better. But, but, but first of all, James, he, he starts with anger. Let's, let's back up and, and talk about this anger thing. One of the first ideas that he talks about in terms of telling us, be a, a heart holiness minded people, is, is let's talk about anger. <laughs> Anybody here need to hear about that? <laughs> Uh, I can't help but think that James kind of starts with that one. Of the many things he probably could have started with in terms of a kicking off statement of something humanity struggles with, it is because he, he, he's like, man, humanity, you, we got some anger issues. 2016, we're all better, right? We're all yeah. loving, loving. No, we don't have, oh man. I, I don't think James was thinking of 2016 when he wrote this, but boy. It sure applies. It's, it's a great launching point. In fact, I, I think James kind of did this on purpose because he goes, now here's a great way to call something out that, that can kind of maybe gauge where we are at spiritually speaking. Last Sunday, I shared a little illustration that I laughed at afterwards about shopping carts. And, and the idea was, you know, in, in James, a couple of chapters later, he says, if you know good and you don't do it, that's sin. And, and we talked about some of the kind of the misinterpretation of that, where someone will go as far as to say, if you don't put the shopping cart away, that's a good thing. You missed out. You're saying you're going to hell. Hmm. And, and, and I was like, no, 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 no. Fortunately, yes, it, it, if you don't put the shopping cart away, it's not going to keep you in heaven. It's not going to keep you out of heaven. But, but afterwards, Courtney came up to me and she, she said something to me that I laughed at. I said, that's a good point. She said, I, I don't know if that person was talking about that verse, but, but somebody came to her and said, you know, but you can tell a whole lot about somebody by how they deal with the shopping cart when they're done with it. You know? And then I was kind of like, that's good thought. You know, fortunately, again, we're not going to go to heaven or hell or be kept out of it based on shopping carts. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but the thought's good. 
You, and, and when he talks about anger here, I can't help but connect that thought he put on my heart this week. He's saying, hey, you can tell a lot. We, we can tell a lot about ourselves by the way we react to the various situations within our lives. Now, this isn't me calling you out or judging you, but this is something for you to internalize. How do I react when I get cut off? on the road. You guys went to Colorado Springs. They're no joke down there <laughs> in terms of driving. In fact, I don't, I don't mean to, to, to bring this up because I don't care for the thought. But I, I've never been shown the universal figure of I don't like you, you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> more than in Colorado Springs with people cutting you off. And, and I, it was a great lesson for me to learn how do I react? I love you. I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm, okay, you can, you can tell a lot about yourselves by the way you react to the various situations that are presented to you. If my first reaction is grrr, frustration, anger, maybe James was saying maybe there's something that we need to work on, that we need to deal with within our lives. You know, and I, 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 uh, I love how James puts it, he, 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 you know, in, in a capacity that says if you're the reverse of this, there's something maybe we got to work on. He said, you know, if you're quick to speak, quick to anger, you know, slow to think that, hey, maybe, guys, there's, there's something that we got to work on. And, and, and the quote that I read this week that, that attached itself so well to this was this. He, he, I don't know who said it. Maybe it's anonymous. But he said, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. <laughs> and I was like, that's awesome. How, how, I mean, that blows my mind. I've never heard that before. But how current it is because... Think about it. By the way God designed you, He was saying, listen more than you speak. Right? But we, yeah, we, we, don't, we don't get that. And, and because we don't listen, because we don't take the time to slow down, we become quick reactors, quick speakers. And that He's saying in a lot of ways is a really quick route to the sin of habitual anger. And, and, and as the next verse will say, really a great root to all the other sins. Because he, he immediately goes into, and therefore, let's get rid of all this stuff. And that's what he does. He, he broadens, he says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent. Humbly accept the word that's planted in you that can save you. So James says, it's not just anger. It's not just anger that, that, that puts on this false religious idea. It's, it, it's, it's all sin. He says, get rid of every moral filth that is filthy in the eyes of God. He says, because this does not produce righteousness. And God says, that's good. He says, get rid of it. That's something we have to internalize today. I, I, I can't force you to do that. But that's something that each one of us can look inward and say, what is in me? What, what is the struggle? What is the Holy Spirit working on? That we know, don't kid yourself, the Holy Spirit's working on. And he's saying, that right there, that one, doesn't speak too clear of a picture about who I am as a Savior. Especially when the world sees you behaving in that sin. And now, now, now let me just continue the thought here. Anger is a very public sin. Uh, struggle, I should say. Let me back up, throw that word sin out and say public struggle, okay? Let me just go with that for now. Very public, okay? I think we're really good at privatizing sin these days. I think we can keep it pretty sensitive these days. And, and a lot of men may not know what you're struggling with because we are very hidden with things. But anger sometimes is the most universally loud thing because we're hit with it. We, we see it on people's faces. I mean, we feel it. It's, it, it's hurts broadcast. And how many of you been watching the Olympics? I've been watching from time to time because I'm a big fan of not, not Michael Phelps as like a human, but as an athlete. He, I, I've heard something about him giving his life to the Lord. I hope that's right. You know, um, I hope it's right. <laughs> but uh, I'm a big fan of him as an athlete. And this Olympics, he was going to blow that record out of the water that he's been having. Most of decorated Olympian ever. Okay, he's lost one time in his main event. The, the butterfly. He is so good at that. That's his stroke. He's lost one time four years ago to this man from South Africa. Okay, here it is four years later, and he's redoing it. He's, he's ready on that same race against that same guy who beat him four years ago. And Michael Phelps, he shows this picture of him. He's sitting in his chair. He's, he's just a man of focus. You can tell his face just stone cold focus. And all of a sudden, that guy comes out that beat him four years ago doing this. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. The Muhammad, Muhammad Ali thing. 
right in front of Michael Phelps. And all of a sudden, you see Michael Phelps' face go from like pure concentration to, <laughs> to like anger. I can't keep my man. And, and, and there was a race that was about to begin, but they wouldn't stop videotaping that because they're like, man, this is good TV, this is drama. America likes that stuff. Of course we do. <laughs> what they ended up doing is that they took a picture of that and they sent it on the old interweb. And that thing went viral, that face he made. It was like a three second face. But it, got, it went viral. This thing called Mei Mei. Anybody know what a Mei is? Some, some of the art kids do. <laughs> um, but it, it basically it's the new way of saying caption this. They, they, they stick a picture on there and they caption what that face might look like. And the funniest caption that I read this week was that moment when you're swimming in that nice cool pool and you hit that mysterious warm spot. <laughs> and I couldn't help but go, oh, that's so funny. It's got my like, you know. It's a three second face, but that, that, that went across the world. And, and every time they talked about him going after that, you know what face they, what picture they used? The angry face. It's now attached to him forever. Now he's the extreme because he's a celebrity and, 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 and that, gets, that happens to him. But ladies and gentlemen, the way you live your lives are speaking more to people than you may realize. And, and what I think we need to consider when James brings this up, all sin, not just anger, all sin, is you're speaking a pretty blunt message about what Jesus means to you by the way you live your life. And he's saying, if you're sick, claiming Christianity, but over here, you're, you're living this life that's just in moral filth. He says, that's not religious. That, you're just, you are just, sorry, you're just religious. But you're not hard holiness because as he's about to go into conversation, I'm sorry I'm, I'm wasting time on illustrations today. But he says, I'm about to say, hard holiness is about this awesome inward reactionary love <laughs> for him. Um, boy, you love it when you get way ahead of your notes and you don't know where you're at. <laughs> Yeah, what are people seeing? That's, that's the question that comes out of that point. What are people seeing? I mean, if they took a picture of your life right now and said, this is Jesus, what would people see? What, what kind of a message would they read? Now, now that's not meant to convict. It's meant to convict, but it's not meant to condemn. It's, it's meant to just begin a process of thought that maybe, maybe I could be more inward instead of so external with faith. And James really hits that point home when he wraps it up. But, but just kind of moving along here because I ain't running out of time. I just want to keep the spirit in check, my spirit in check, and let the spirit speak here. But another strong point, he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. <laughs> I love it when James speaks so bluntly because what he basically says there is he goes, here is a root to the problem with the lack of holiness people within this world. And the, and the root to the problem is a lack of biblical application. I mean, there's a lot of people out there. We talked about this morning about how illiterate our, our, our little generations are because they don't even, I don't know if they've ever even held a Bible. But there's a lot of people out there that, that have the word that speak to them every day. In fact, it's speaking at you right now. And, and they hear it, but they just forget it. You know what that is, one, one ear out the other. I have to apologize, I do that to my wife all the time. <laughs> all the time. Some of you may know this about me. If you don't know this about me, I'm a major Dallas Cowboy fan. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> we do forgive And whenever the Cowboys play, I'm pretty, I'm pretty like into the, to the, to the game. And I love my wife; she's so good. Oh, but sometimes she'll start talking <laughs> in the middle of the game, and like a full-on conversation. And I hear her; I know she's talking, but I'm, a, I'm watching the game, and and so I'll, I'll see her talking, and and I can tell she's asking me questions, and so I just kind of go, uh huh, yeah, mm hmm. And then all of a sudden she'll stop talking. And that's almost worse than her starting to talk because I know she's over there still looking at me. And so what I have to do is go, what's up? And, and she'll go, 
what did I just say? <laughs> what did you just say? Yes, you weren't even listening. And I'll go, ha uh, uh you know, start all over. And then she'll go, I was talking for like 10 minutes! And I'll go, you gotta start over. <laughs> I don't, I mean to do that too, but it's, it, sorry, I'm a man. Women, forgive me. I don't mean to do that, but I guess I do. Um, we do that to the word, I think. We're pretty focused on, on what we're doing right after church, maybe. <laughs> Where we're pretty focused on what I got going on the rest of the week. That, that, that we just come in and merely listen to the word. Merely. What a word to use. Merely listen to it. It's half-hearted. Not really there. It speaks. I like James's illustration better. He, he, he says, it's like walking to a, it's like looking in a mirror and forgetting what you look like the second you walk away. That's hard to do. I like James's illustration better because it's hard to do that. I'm pretty sure most of us know what we look like. It'd be pretty hard to forget it. So what James is saying there, when this speaks at you, but yet you still just, still just merely listen to it, he's saying, that's not holiness. That's just what religious people do. He says holiness people, man, they listen to it and guess what? They live it. They do it. It's in their lives. It's a part of them. You can tell a lot about people by the way they live their lives. And what I mean by that, and I know it's a very, very general statement there, but I, what I mean by that is there's a lady, she's 99 years old, loved her to death. You're going to meet her in heaven one day. Her name's Hazel. She loved Jesus in a way that just, I just, I was so boggled. I was like, how can you love him so, so much? And, and, and I realized I'm a pastor saying that because she was so deeply in love with this guy, God. I, was, I just was baffled at how she demonstrated, how, how kind she was, how good she was. And she didn't have much, but there was no doubt. That she was in the Word. And she loved the Word. And, oh, I bet you she's in that. She died a long time ago. But I bet you when Jesus saw her coming, she was like, get up here. She went, nine you to hug. That was a good life. You lived well. <laughs> I, I, I once preached a sermon that uh, when I had a whole lot of money in the church. And, and, and we're getting it, friends. We're doing good. And not that money needs to stop this. But we have it. And so I had this big wall built behind me. And I had these camouflage sheets put in front of them. And I had all this camo, head-to-toe camo, that my father had given me. And I, I preached that whole sermon right in front of that camo. And I had videotaped myself. And it was so cool because I, I, I almost disappeared. But yet I was preaching the word. And, and, and even, you know, it was a holiness message. I hope it was good, you know, but it, it blasting out the goodness of God. I was so camouflaged. That then that, that you realize, you know, that it was a pastor, a person up there speaking, and, I, and the whole point of the sermon was, man, we sure do are pretty good sometimes at just speaking it. But oh man, it's a whole different world in living it and sticking out and saying, I am not like this world. I am set apart. I'm going to the world to come. And James says that several times. Get rid of the filth. He even wraps it up by saying, get rid of the world, tame the tongue, take care of those who are in need. This is what true holiness looks like. So look intently into the perfect word. It's not merely listening, it's applying it. It's, it's in there. It's application. It's part of us. Now, we've got to wrap up the pure and faultless faith. And I always think it's funny. I saw this thing on Facebook the other day. It, it was a meme. It was a picture of a kid just bawling. And, and the caption underneath it said, that moment when the pastor says it's the last point and he's already preached for 45 minutes. <laughs> It'll go quick, I promise. But, but the last way of holding this life that I think James brings up here and he wraps it up with this is, is, and he brings it back to a specific again. He says, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, they deceive themselves for that kind of religion. Their religion is worthless. A, a tongue, that idea of not keeping a tight rein on it, it goes back to that first point of, of slowing down, praying about it, thinking about it, restraint, making sure your words are of his and not of your reactionary self. Tame the tongue. The word religion here is thresco which refers to outward religion, uh, outward forms of faith and ceremony. In other words, James is saying these, are, these people are religious because they, they, they do the work kind of out here. They, they, they speak it. It's, it's verb, but, but it's nothing in here. 
And, and so the connection being, he says, the people that live like that, they're just religious. They, they, they don't tame the tongue. They don't have anything to do that even resembles a life like Christ. And he says, that's not holiness. That's just religion. Holiness people are becoming Christ. One of my favorite phrases that I've ever heard, and I stole it from a pastor. I don't know who said it, but I stole it from him. And his phrase were, don't do faith. Have faith. And I thought that was neat because a lot of people do faith. They're, they're pretty good at swinging the hammer for the church, maybe even saying a prayer or two. You know, but the boy, they don't have faith. It's not here. Um, Sandy has been coming to church for quite a while now. She's on a trip right now. And uh, um, that parade was awesome the other day. Downtown, I, I thought it was great. Get the name out there, spread the word a little bit. Get BBS advertised. It was awesome. Frank, I love your truck. Thanks for letting us borrow it. But it's hot in that cab. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, it's different when you're driving down the road at 60 miles an hour and the air can cool you down. But when you're going like 0. 0.2 and the windows don't roll down and the vents do, I was inside that, that little cab going, I'm dying. I'm dying. <laughs> So we give me some water. I was driving down there with Sandy. She's sitting back. She goes, Pastor, that parade was awesome. It really did well for the church. But you know what? It looked like you were dead. And I was like, because I was. I'm so sorry. I, I was about to die in that parade. You, 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 stu, you speak a lot by the way you live your lives. Pure and faultless faith, James says, is the care of widows looking after the orphan, those who are in distress, getting rid of this world, taming the tongue. And so, 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 so if we are a holiness people, we, we're not just looking at the problem and, and keeping it an arm length away. We're, we're diving in because Jesus dove in. He dove into our mess. And so, so how, how can we then be expected to go, I'm not gonna touch your mess, that's dirty. He says, true and faultless faith dives into the mess. He says, uh, everything else is just religion. True faith is getting this thing in here put into action in the love and in the truth of it all. Last of the church, I promise, went to this, went to this when I was a, a youth pastor. Sorry, I don't know where I was, couldn't get those words out. But I was a youth pastor in college church over there in Nampa. Um, we, took a whole, we took 40 kids down to inner city L.A., and anybody ever been to LA? They, they call it Skid Row, I think it is. It's like, like that 16 block square where it just seems like they shepherd all the homeless people into. And, and it's just a, a really tough situation. The first night that we were there, they, they, we went around this prayer tour, we were in these vans, and I was driving these kids, kind of fearing for their lives. I'll be honest, I was a little judgmental at first. But when the Lord opened my eyes, it was, it was a big moment for me. And I'll tell you the moment he opened my eyes to, to the, to the depth of the mess of the problem. There was this man who was walking down the road. He was, he was pushing a dolly with one of those big lips on the end and pushing a dolly. And, and on the edge of that lip was two children, couldn't have been older than three or one. Three and one. One of them was just an infant. And they were huddled in this little blanket, just shivering. And, and dad was doing this, pushing them in. And what he was doing was sizing up spots in the road because there were so many homeless people sleeping on the sidewalk that he was trying to size up a space big enough for him and his two children to huddle up on and go to sleep on. And at that point, I had two children the same age. And the spirit got into my soul and went, man, put yourself in that guy's shoes. How hard that is. How, how humiliating. Man, you can, you can do something for them. It may not be much, but something for them. My heart just opened up, and the rest of the week was a lot better. Pals dot inner city LA. But there is a need here. There are people here, and plenty of opportunity for pure and faultless faith to not just be religiously shown, but lived within our community. Now, we, we talked about this in, in Sunday school about amen being, I'm agreeing and I will do it. That's what you said. Willing I'm willing to submit. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Am I willing to submit? Get rid of this world. True, true, true heart holiness. Get rid of this world. Tame the tongue. Slow down. Process. Pray. 
would dive into the need. This, he says, is what true religion, true faith is. Getting into the mess and loving Jesus the whole time. Amen? Amen. Oh, Lord, I, I pray that your words were heard and not mine. Again, I prayed so much for that this week. I struggled with this one. I, but I, I just pray, God, that, that you spoke and, and, and that you would give us an opportunity this week to not just be religious, not just people that went to church on Sunday, but the but, but, but people that are now like in a, a heart holiness place, God, that, 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 that says, I don't want to just be like, like, like do church. I, I want to I be the church. I want to be your hands. I want to be your feet because you saved me from me. You saved me from my mess and my, my moral filth and you set me on higher ground. So I, I pray, Lord, that I wouldn't just, just keep my eyes off those who are also stuck in moral filth, but, but, but instead you would help me to reach down and, and get a little dirty, get a little messy, and get into this world and help people get pulled out of that filth, pulled into higher ground. Would you give us opportunities this week, Lord, to be a people, to be a going church, to be a heart holiness church, not just religious people, but people filled with you, loving you, surrendered to you, once again, Lord, let the words of a man fall to the ground. Would, would you be heard today? Send us into the weak. We ask for forgiveness for being religious. But now give us a great week of opportunity to be a holiness people. I, I love you, God. And it is in your holy name that we pray. Amen.